So Tinakota Katoa, everyone. Thanks again for joining me and my colleagues at the law school, discussing another side of the COVID um, pandemic from a legal perspective. This time I'm joined um, with a group of colleagues who've been organized by my colleague, Professor Alberto Costi, to discuss the international dimensions of um, the crisis, which is very, very appropriate because Alberto's own book launch of his book, International Law in New Zealand, of which several of the panelists are co-authors, was delayed because of COVID-19. So Alberto is very aware of the effect of COVID-19 on international law. Um, he'll start off talking about WHO and some of the um, organizational issues in relation to the international structure. My colleague Michelle Zhang will then talk about the World Trade Organization and international trade. My, then my very old intellectual property colleague Susie Franco will talk about intellectual property dimensions of the crisis, building I hope on some of her really fantastic research she's doing about um, drug development and the use of information and all of that stuff, much you can touch on in five minutes or 10 minutes. Then followed by um, Bjorn Oliver, who will talk um, about international environmental law and followed by Joe Anamosa at the very end, who will talk about the law of the sea. So without further ado, Alberto, we'd like to start. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Tenakoto Katoa, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I have to say, you know, in the, uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, the WHO has played a big role. It's been harshly criticized in some corners by, by the United States administration, the Australian government, for its ineptitude and laziness uh, or coziness with, with, uh, with China and laziness in taking measures a bit more appropriate more quickly. There's been also a lot of blame attributed to China for the delay in making public some of the events that were occurring, lack of transparency, lack of accuracy on the data that we've seen. And uh, more recently, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, has been as criticized, has denounced the lack of action on the part of the Security Council. So there's no doubt that this pandemic is testing the limits of the multilateral system and the United Nations in particular. As the Secretary General Guterres said uh, this week, it's really the most important challenge in, in the history of the United Nations since the Second World War. And he's also alerted us to the risk of a, of a famine of a biblical nature in developing countries. Now, this said, it's a bit easy to be critical of the United Nations. It's also quite uh, easy to be criticizing the slow response of the UN and the WHO and the international community more generally. But one must really understand how the WHO and the UN actually work. Now, the UN organization is composed of several organs, bodies, programs, and agencies. These include the Security Council, the General Assembly, the United Nations Development Program, as well as the World Food Programs. I mentioned those because I will come back to them in, in a few minutes' time. But while in the United Nations organizations, there's the whole UN system. And with the UN system, we're talking here that comprises not only the UN, its various organs and programs, but also a number of specialized agencies. Agencies that have specific mandates, such as the International Monetary Fund and the WHO. And they are, in fact, working in conjunction with the United Nations, but they are, in fact, separate intergovernmental organizations. The WHO's role, as you all probably will know by now, the core mandate is in issues of global health. It's really looking at the effects of activities, omissions, actions on health in general. Now, in terms of the role of the WHO, it's one really to direct and coordinate action on the international, on international health work. It issues, or the members, when they meet as the assembly of the parties, issue regulations that can bind member states. The best example, and more cogent for our crisis at the moment, has to be the International Health Regulations, or IHR. They are key not only to prevent, but also to protect 
control and also provide a public health response to the spread of international the international spread of disease states parties and that's the important thing state parties must notify the who of events that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern within 24 hours and also they have to take health measures without delay these are binding obligations on states that said the problem really is that even if a member fails to do so rapidly, promptly, the problem might be that even in case of a dispute, the problem will be in case of disagreement, where, how do we solve the dispute? And in fact, the IHR's application in terms of dispute resolution takes the form of arbitration. And this arbitration will require the consent of the respondent state. So you can well imagine that that might be difficult to bring before a body, before an arbitral tribunal, a state that is deemed not to have reacted quickly enough. But these, but I think it is important to see that in reality, the fact is that these IHR the, that are in, in place and the latest iteration is that of 2005, it really ushers in, ushered in a system or an era of rules-based surveillance and notification. What I mean by that is that states, in a way, can be said in theory to be given up some sovereignty, but it is for to share goals of the international community to improve health and to protect the community against spread of disease. The obligations, in fact, reflect more an understanding of best practices that are heavily dependent on national authorities' collection of data and designation of responsible authorities for the implementation of health measures. In reality, the requirements for states are to ensure capacity building. It is important that they, they share information, that they are ready to implement the recommendations of the WHO. And in fact, it really is the ability to take action when the WHO issues a public health emergency of international concern, what the Secretary General or Director General of the WHO did at the end of January 2020, and then in March, he even said that this was a global pandemic. But what I want you to understand is that WHO really is governance by information, cooperation, and there is no real power of compliance. As the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Scotty Morrison of Australia said today in, in a public interview, it lacks it lacked teeth. But indeed, it's really is one of cooperation. Now, if I turn briefly to the role of the United Nations, again, the General Assembly is the only plenary organ of the United Nations, that is where every member, 193 members of the United Nations have an equal voice. Well, it has adopted two resolutions so far, unanimously, at the beginning of April, one that underscored the need for cooperation and global response based on unity, solidarity, and multilateral efforts. And, then the, and earlier this week, it passed another resolution unanimously for the need for global access to medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment to face COVID-19. Problem though, the General Assembly resolutions are not binding. They are, the General Assembly only has a power of recommendation. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Security Council, the power, who has a lot of power. It has the power to pass resolutions that are binding on all member states. It has the power to act when it determines that there is a threat to peace and security. And this is where the problem is, is that it is subject, as many of you will know, to a power of veto of the five permanent members. And even if most Security Council members want to act on this crisis and they want to deal with the pandemic, and especially the risk of this pandemic has on or the impact on stability, in existing zones of conflict. The problem, though, is that there are it's a politicized body. And what happens, obviously, China opposes any attempt to put in the text of a resolution the idea that it, the, the COVID-19 originated from there. Now, other programs that exist, and in fact are quite important to mention, are the World Food Program, which already as early as 20, uh, January 25th this year, had already started to work on this pandemic by looking by dispatching personal protection equipment, uh, storing and preparing food commodities, 
ensuring that channels of supply exist and continue to exist even when pandemic, pandemic hit. It has a huge budget, 1.6 billion, a quarter of which comes from donation from the United States. The UN Development Program that was once chaired by Helen Clark, the mission is to eradicate poverty, reduce inequalities, and build resilience to crisis. It has already, it is supporting the health systems in vulnerable states. It is anticipating funds to support preparedness for COVID-19. And long-term mission is to assess the social and economic impacts. A large, I think over 3 billion budget, and the U.S., again, is one of the main donors. These shows that there, the U.N. is doing a lot of work behind the scenes, but what is that enough? That might be a question. We are running out of time, and I will not really look at state responsibility. We might come back to that in the chat, Jeff, regarding the idea of uh, whether China could be sued before international tribunals. But I just want to complete uh, this by just making a few brief uh, uh, remarks. One, that the WHO is acting within the parameters that have been set by its membership. Unless the members are ready to change its constitution, are ready to beef up its IHRs and increase its funding, it works with what it can, with what it has. The UN has been criticized by, but the role of the Security Council is in a health crisis is limited. We really want a politicized body to take decisions that address health issues. I prefer doctors to do that. What we should be worried about, and I'll complete on that, Jeff, is that it is crucial for UN agencies to show that they can play a significant role to help poorer countries to manage the fallout from COVID-19 and to avoid the worsening of conflicts. We need to show that multilateralism matters as pandemics will come, others will come, and there are transnational cross-border problems like climate change that we need to be able to address as an in international community. Otherwise, what can we, what we are leaving it as, some, as we have seen with this response to COVID, too much to states. We, I'm, I'm worried about borders rising again and citizens returning to their states of nationality and all the impact this may have on global partnership. Uh, thanks for a bit yeah. of that very quick run through of WHO and IHRs and the broad international legal scene. Now to Michelle, who's a colleague who joined us about 18 months ago. She's an expert in international trade law and she'll talk now about the international trade dimension of resolving the crisis. Michelle? Yes, um, thank you, Jeff. And for my 10 minute slot today, I would like to offer a brief overview on what has happened so far and what might be happening soon insofar as trade regulation is concerned. So first of all, what has happened? So the most pressing issue at this moment for every government is to deal with the threat to public health. So actually from the early February, WTO members, um, for those who are not familiar with um, international trade, um, WTO stands for World Trade Organization who covers the membership of more than 150 countries. So from early February, WTO members have in total enforced more than 80 domestic measures to cope with the COVID-19 outbreak. So generally speaking, such emergency measures can be divided into three groups, three types. The first one refers to measures that facilitate and expedite the transit of essential goods, such as food, um, PPE, personal protective equipment, and certain medical supplies. So specific measures include um, eliminating duties, simplifying the importing process, and putting in place temporary but you really much simplified procedures for compulsory certification. So the second type of measures, emergency measures, refers to temporary restrictive measures, on the other hand, to export of essential goods. So measures as such might be controversial with respect to their compatibility with countries' commitment at WTO, where um, the rules 
uh, prohibit permanent export restriction on trading goods. So for example, there is Europe-wide export authorization requirement at the moment on a list of essential goods. Um, in the latest announcement from the European Commission, it was made very clear that this measure is temporary in nature, which therefore is in compliance with EU's WTO obligations. So in other words, insofar as the WTO members are not imposing permanent export restrictions, they are complying their commitment multilaterally. So the last group of responsive measure takes the form of a collection of commitment specifically made in the COVID-19 context. So last week, New Zealand and Singapore launched the so-called declaration on trade in essential goods for combating the COVID-19 pandemic. The purpose of the declaration is to ensure the production and trade in essential goods to flow freely. So the commitment there under include eliminating duties on essential goods, promises not to impose any permanent export restriction, and a series of measures to facilitate and speed up the transit of essential goods. So declaration is up there op and open for the rest of WTO membership to sign on. So this is a very um, brief overview over um, about the policy response so far from the WTO membership. So the second priority in the coming months or even years would be to deal with the decline of the global economy and to prepare for assistance for the recovery that follows. So the trade forecast so far is sobering. So the world trade is expected to fall up to one third and the predicted decline will be likely exceeding the one caused by the last financial crisis in the year of 2008. So, but on the other hand, estimates of expected recovery are currently very positive for the year 2021, but it is very uncertain the ultimate outcomes will largely, dependent, will largely depend on the duration of the outbreak as well as the effectiveness of the policy responses so far adopted by different countries. So looking into the future, one major concern is also over the potential rights of trade protection as a result of the economic decline. So unfortunately, it was the case after for example, the Great, the Great Depression uh, in the 30s and the global financial crisis in 2008. Mercifully, so far, to a much lesser extent in the current crisis. So learning from the history, the majority of the WTO membership has reached a common understanding that trade liberalization has played and will play an important role in the economy recovery. Policy measures that may aid the recovery will thus become the top priority of all the government after the outbreak. So we are at the moment indeed facing a future with huge amount of uncertainties and challenges. Um, having that being said, there is a slightly positive side of the story if we, if we look at the whole entire picture. So because of the pandemic, a number of governments are pushing forward many trade facilitating uh, mechanisms that have been pending for many years, such as contactless online, uh, contactless online certification and customer's clearance. There are also widespread rising demands for further liberalization in medical and health related products, particularly towards developing and least developed regions. So pandemic is just um, the starting point. The best wish is that the effort and spirit as such will continue to maintain in the near future or in the, in the, in the future. Um, on that note, I would like to conclude my presentation today. Um, looking forward to a discussion uh, later on. Thank you.
significant of stress even before the pandemic. Um, and one wonders whether the current American administration, for example, will be in a good position to lead as American administrations have done international recoveries and international trade. But I know nothing about international trade. So we've got to move on very quickly to Professor Susie Frankel, who I'm very pleased to see I think is back in New Zealand because for a while she was actually in New York during some of the beginning parts of the pandemic there as an international fellow or scholar at, at New York University. So welcome back, Susie. I haven't seen you again since. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, so thank you. Um, okay, I hope this mic is working. I've had quite a lot of trouble with it, so you're nodding good, because I'm teaching remotely, joining the remote world of Zoom teachers to New York University, where Jeff is quite right. I was there earlier in March, but I've done lots of isolation and quarantine and, and very well and always have been. So it's widely agreed that this one of a huge part of the solution to the pandemic must involve medicine treatments and a vaccine. And we all know that as yet, no effective medical treatment is widely available and no vaccine has yet been developed. The international intellectual property system has largely developed around patent law and the mechanisms and institutions that go with that to provide incentives to innovate in any area. What this system really has done, and there's been a lot of protest about it for years, is to give a disproportionate amount of power to private interests in public health matters. And in a sense, the patent system is under the test and will be even more under the test if it isn't able to work effectively for a medical solution for COVID-19 that's medical treatment and vaccine solution, which is available and accessible to all countries and all peoples, no matter what the cost. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of innovators involved in pharmaceutical companies working extremely hard to find vaccines and so on. We've already seen many people improve the diagnosis but that in itself doesn't mean that the system as a whole is functioning well. There's far too much reliance on hoping that these companies will cooperate and share the information they have, which can be about the efficacy of the pharmaceuticals and vaccine treatments in particular, rather than choosing to share the information being the starting place and the expected norm. Alberto mentioned information sharing. There's a lot of health information from hospitals, but efficacy of medicines is another set of information. We've also seen a number of the large platforms in the last few days indicate that they will share the information and data they have towards the COVID-19 response. What I'm focusing on is really the clinical information that relates to medicines and vaccines. Now, patenting law, when it's at its worst, but also at its most important, is highly technical and highly detailed. But I do want to, at the time available, give a brief overview of some of the types of patents and the outcomes of if those patents are enforced, what that might mean. So patents for new treatments will exist, but it takes a long time to develop new treatments. So we've seen a lot of discussion of existing pharmaceuticals, and some will be clinically trialled in New Zealand to treat COVID-19. And some of those will be what are known as second use patents, which have a variety of forms. Others might be patents around vaccines. One of the more publicised uh, possible existing medicines that could be used as a treatment, the remdesivir medicine, is already in what is called phase three of clinical trials. That's the phase where it's randomised tests on large groups of patients. What's been most interesting about that, I think, from the patent perspective is that Gilead, originally the patent owner of the here, applied to the Food and Drug Administration in the US to have that medicine classified as kind of an orphan medicine, which gives extra incentives to how it's used. But there was such outrage at the idea that something that could be used to treat a global pandemic could be named orphaned. That application 
application was reasonably quickly withdrawn, although you can see a lot of media around that. Now, that's only one example, but it gives a concern about the type of private interest behaviour that the patent system incentivises, and it's not at all just a public health system, as we've seen in many ways. That said, the optimist in me remains there that a public health response will be met by many pharmaceutical company interests. So for a variety of reasons, however, it might be that we also see less patents in this area. There can be a bunch of reasons for that. One or two of which are that if you're looking at a second use of a known pharmaceutical, the novelty in that second use may well have been destroyed by the amount of discussion around it. Nevertheless, there will be attempts to patent those kinds of things. We may also see few, fewer patents because there is active cooperation going on among some researchers, particularly in universities, but also we've seen cooperation between some pharmaceutical companies, and that's pretty unusual. So those are sort of signs of optimism. However, there's a, something very unusual here for the patent system. Often patents are justified because of the long time of research and development and the need to recoup investment costs. Putting it not meaning to be cynically, there is a very large market already waiting for the medicines and the vaccines here. There's not necessarily a need for a patent to shore up that market, although of course patents can operate to make sure that only certain parts of those willing and able to access vaccines actually get it. And that's where talking about patent law, both as an international issue and as a domestic law issue, becomes really important. As an international issue, in recent years, we saw the amendment of the TRIPS agreement, the WTO, in a very limited sphere to address medical needs or medicine needs in the developing world. And we're not likely in the short term to see that kind of amendment or the WTO, or indeed need it necessarily for this pandemic. But to put it more precisely and what effect this international law has at home, if we think about the ways that a vaccine might be developed and how that may become available in New Zealand, it helps to illustrate the web of complex international patent law. So first up, we have heard the Director General of, pa of Public Health say that he's working both with Australia to make sure New Zealand has an access to a vaccine and hopefully with others. And I don't doubt that intention at all. And it's, I personally am a great fan of the public health response in New Zealand and the quality of it. The concerns are this. Unless we make the vaccine here, that's one option, we don't have that much control over it. The ability to make the vaccine here, some scientists and some labs have actually come out and said that they could do research into that. However, manufacturing in New Zealand could also take place even if it's licensed from an entity overseas, provided that we have the ability and the capacity to do so. I'm not sure if we do, I'd be great to hear that we do. But of course, then there's a question of manufacturing it and reaching the appropriate scale. We have seen attempts for people to corner the potential vaccine market, not least of all by the President of the United States. That doesn't look like that's going to succeed because there's a global pushback against that. But it does shine a light on the issue of when the vaccine comes, how much will be produced and where will it be distributed? Well, we could in New Zealand through our importing of medicine system, and I won't take time to go through that whole system, publicly funded and so on, import directly from pharmaceutical manufacturers, and that's clearly possible. We could license to make it here if we have the facility to do so. We could, if it's developed, import generic versions of whatever drug is developed. But we can, we, and we might be incentivized to do that if the overall price is cheaper. But what if we can't do either? What if generics aren't produced except under what's called compulsory license? Then New Zealand, like many developed countries, has taken the stand that we will not import generic products that are made under compulsory license. There's a bit of complicated detail around that. 
but there is an open letter signed by many entities and so on calling on the governments of the just check the number, the 37 WTO members to declare themselves eligible importing members. And what that really means is that we should declare ourselves as New Zealand eligible to import medicines made under compulsory license to address the pandemic. Now, to be clear, we would only need to do that both if those medicines are developed and if they're made under compulsory license. We wouldn't need to declare ourselves this technical eligible importer if it's imported in the usual way, either under a voluntary license or just simply produced directly from the innovative pharmaceutical companies. Now, I mentioned this because that is an international system, the compulsory licensing and its rules that's taken a long time to develop. But if New Zealand wants to have the benefit of that, it actually needs to declare its status and effectively change its status at domestic law in order to make the most of the international system. So we're out of time. It's an overview of some of the way patents can interfere. The optimist of me says that the patent world will come to the party and help solve this pandemic. Right, great. Thanks, Susie, for that huge amount of subject in, in less than 10 minutes. Probably lots to come back to both in this presentation, but also in lots of other presentations. One's always reminded just how small New Zealand is in the end and how dependent we are on the favours of other countries and unfortunately, big companies. Um, just to introduce to the, our next speaker is Bjorn Oliver Magsig, who's our newest colleague. I was about to say he arrived about the same time as the virus, but that would be a very uncharitable thing to say. Bjorn Oliver is an expert in international environmental law, including um, water law and other um, subjects. But he's going to talk to us about COVID and international environmental law. Bjorn Oliver. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I didn't bring the virus. Um, what I would like to talk about today is um, basically two points. So one is the role of international environmental law in addressing this or the next pandemic. Um, probably both. And then the second one, um, impacts of the coronavirus on international environmental law in general, but with a focus on climate change. Um, and I hope we have time for, for discussion on that point as well. So what is the role of international environmental law in addressing uh, the current and the next pandemic? So the current pandemic is just another stark reminder, I think, of um, that we have a massive disconnect between us humans and the environment. So our societies and economies are operating on a very thin margin, uh, which has become very obvious in the recent months. And we continuously push the environment into smaller corners. So it looks like uh, COVID-19 was not manufactured in a lab, as some claim. Um, it's still not 100% clear where it came from, where it originated, but it seems to be pretty certain that it is just one uh, of uh, just another zoonic disease um, in a whole list of uh, diseases like SARS, Ebola. And scientists presume that the virus may have jumped from an animal host, uh, either pangolin or bat, into humans. Um, so there is this, this direct link between the environment and the crisis we're in, um, right in the front of the uh, in the front of the attention now. So it has the origin in in our inability, or even the inability of the whole international community, you could argue, to protect our wildlife, our forests, and also to govern land use change more appropriately, more effectively. Uh, and that has led to the disappearance of those traditional buffer zones that used to separate us, the humans, from those wild animals. The bigger picture, though, if you take a step back, is that the traditional legal structures that are in place, they are still constraining international environmental law. They're making it difficult for us to come up uh, or implement concepts like the ecosystem to fully comprehend what it means in legal terms. We're struggling with that as international lawyers. Um, and it also um, sh shows that um, we're struggling to use law in a way that fully appreciates this connection between the health of the environment 
biodiversity and us um, humans. So if uh, it is true that, as some scientists say, the pangolins are the most, um, are the, the source of this virus, or at least in the chain of the transmission of the virus, um, then we're talking about the most trafficked animal in the world, despite there being a ban on trading it by CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So we have a law, um, we have a law banning trade of the animal, but nonetheless, um, it's partially responsible for this outbreak we see now. Um, so why do we uh, hunt them? We want to use the uh, scales for traditional medicines. Uh, we use um, them for fashion industry. Um, some think the meat is a delicacy. Um, so yes, our hunt for this animal seems to have contributed to the crisis we're in now. Um, also, I want to briefly talk about the suspected source in Wuhan, which is a so-called wet market, a wet market that also traded illegal wildlife. So there is this another chain uh, in the links that led to, to the coronavirus crisis. Um, unsanitary, cramped, usually not very well regulated markets, um, trading illegal wildlife and have done so uh, for a while. Uh, Chinese authorities have reacted. Uh, they have banned uh, all domestic wildlife trade and consumption in February, I think it was the end of February. Other countries like Vietnam followed and they've done so before, uh, just after SARS, they've done the same, uh, similar kind of virus, uh, similar reaction. But the risk is that that all moves underground and it has so before. Um, so what about CITES, the Convention on International Trade uh, in Endangered Species? Um, I mentioned that uh, the panga lines are on that list. Uh, they're not supposed to be uh, traded and member states have adopted uh, measures, passed it into a regulation, created institutions, but everything around that has happened, or most of it at least, has happened on the supply side. Um, the demand side, not so much in focus. And I think this is where we have to change in order to prevent a next pandemic from happening. Uh, so there's the argument that we need to address exotic wildlife consumption, um, the demand side as well. How do you do it? Uh, with education, um, with marketing, more effective marketing based on the culture you're, you're trying to address. Um, you go for the root causes of consumption rather than um, trying to ban something which will then just end up being traded underground. Uh, and just to be clear, we cannot blame wildlife consumption as uh, a problem of Asia's weird appetite. Um, we in the so-called West also are responsible for driving up the demand. Uh, we use uh, wild animals, leather for high uh, luxury goods, fashion industry, I mentioned that. Um, it becomes obvious that we need to work together more effectively at the global level to address the root causes of consumption, which will then decrease the risk of a next pandemic. So what are the impacts of coronavirus for international environmental law? So very briefly, um, at the bigger picture, I said that um, we have this disconnect between us and the environment. Uh, so will we learn from this episode? Will we support our global conventions that exist like CITES, uh, which have valuable and important principles embedded in them, uh, where we support them with procedural rules, secondary rules, to make it more difficult for states to violate international environmental law. Um, I think what becomes obvious when you look at the response to COVID-19, that states react in very different ways. Um, so the, to look into the future of international environmental law uh, is very tricky. Um, but what also becomes obvious is that some states actually respond in a way that is driven by something else than just self-interest. Um, so the ideas of intergenerational equity, collective goods, making sacrifices for the vulnerable, um, they have reappeared in the discussion. So that's promising, I think. Um, but will states then at the international level also react in a similar way? Uh, being more open to those principles and also supporting those principles with more hard uh, 
secondary rules. Um, so the health crisis seems to have given our planet a short breathing space, um, a short-term breathing space. Um, and it's been estimated that around 5.5% of, uh, of the equivalent of last year's CO2 emissions will be saved by this crisis. Uh, it's nothing to celebrate from, from an environmental laws perspective. Uh, first of all, because of course, uh, with the death toll that's linked to this, we don't want to save the environment at that cost. Um, but also, as I mentioned, it's just short term. The long term impact of the corona uh, crisis, I think, is a rather negative one. Um, we still have to do a lot more than uh, what will happen through the coronavirus to, um, to save the climate from, from getting out of hand, to stay below two degrees warming, for example. Um, so we are far away from achieving that goal, even with something like the coronavirus hitting us, our economies. Um, it just shows us how difficult addressing this climate crisis is. So we are at a point where we can think about a hard reset. We have the opportunity to take stock, to say, how do we build a more resilient future? But will we do so? That's the big question. And we have the the climate conference in Glasgow, COP26, which has been postponed, um, but um, states are, of course, still um, uh, negotiating their climate change positions. They're working on their nationally determined uh, contributions, hopefully, um, and they're due by the end of this year. So will they reflect or rethink in, in that sense that we take that into consideration what happened because of the corona? virus crisis or not. Um, some states like Chile have said they want to submit more ambitious NDCs, but it is not very likely that we see uh, a lot more states to follow suit. Um, so the worry is that we will see the same that happened after the financial crisis of 2008, money flowing disproportionately into the old oil, gas and coal production industries um, that we won't learn from previous mistakes. Um, and some um, political parties, obviously the Greens, have come up with the idea of linking the recovery program to green infrastructure. So it's an obvious thing to do. Uh, we have an opportunity to affect radical uh, change, long-term challenges. Climate change is this long-term challenge. We have a short-term crisis and followed by this long-term challenge that still exists. Why wouldn't we combine those two and say, okay, let's build a more resilient future. We're pushed here, um, but we can actually do it with something like green infrastructure, create jobs and a safer environment. Um, so the big question, what kind of post-coronavirus future do we want? Uh, it depends on all the developments in different nation states. They will then feed into the international system. Um, other states have already um, taken several steps back in terms of climate change, um, climate change legislation. Um, so we in New Zealand are at a relatively comfortable position, I think, uh, with this government that we can make several steps forward, but it remains to be seen whether um, my optimistic outlook uh, is justified. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bjorn Oliver, for that talk everywhere from the forest of Wuhan to everywhere in the world, pretty much. Um, it's very impressive linking together. And now, finally, um, with the, um, with the um, biggest question of all, probably, the oceans that surround us, Joanna Mossop. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and I'm going to speak today about um, cruise ships and the entry of cruise ships into port. Um, so one of the news items that we've seen in the pandemic is the situation with um, cruise ships being denied entry into port, for example. Um, and also we've seen that some cruise ships have suffered quite severe outbreaks of the pandemic. Um, and so there's been quite a focus on that and, and for good reason. I mean, we saw that the Ruby Princess cruise ship was the source of infections here in New Zealand and it had an even bigger impact in Australia when the cruise ship passengers were allowed to disembark. 
And, and following those instances, Australia um, has um, <laughs> Australia has prohibited the entry of um, cruise ships, and so they ended up having to sort of sit outside ports. Um, so what is the situation um, with entry into port, and do cruise ships have a right to enter port, or can port states choose to prefer the health status of um, the, the general population? Well, the first um, state, state step to, to look at is the fact that ports are classified under international law as internal waters, and internal waters are subject solely to the sovereignty of the coastal state. And so they have the right in normal circumstances to prohibit entry into port and to impose conditions on entry into port. Um, so um, that's in a really important, st important starting point. However, that sovereign position is balanced by a number of obligations. So for example, there's an obligation under international law for both vessels and states to provide assistance if there is an emergency at sea. Um, and in the case of states, um, the obligation to assist continues until the people in distress have been embarked at a place of safety. There is also a, uh, an obligation under customary international law um, to allow vessels in distress entry into ports, to allow them to remedy the problem that has caused them to be in distress. So if a vessel is in distress, then it does have the right to enter ports, um, even if that is contrary to the rules of the port state. So what does being in distress mean? Well, essentially, a ship that is in distress has to be in an extraordinary situation. And the situation should put the um, lives of the crew or the passenger at risk. And traditional examples of ships in distress included those that have been subjected to extreme weather and needed to take shelter, or that crucial engine equipment had failed. An important point to note that if, is if that the, the lives of the passengers or crew are not at risk, then distress doesn't apply, and the port state can still exclude it from, from its ports. And this issue has arisen um, most frequently in the context of oil tankers, where the vessel may have sustained dis destruction um, or problems as a result of extreme weather and is at, release, uh, is at risk of releasing oil into the environment. And we saw examples of these ships being sent from port to port because ports were worried that if they came into port and discharged the oil into the local environment, it would cause extreme damage. Um, but they could do this at, because the lives of the crew weren't at risk. So it wasn't a, a humanitarian crisis, it was really an environmental and economic crisis. And you might suggest that that's not necessarily a good outcome, but it is the way the law has developed. So, if the lives aboard the cruise ship are endangered, um, then the ship may be in distress. But if it's possible to provide assistance to the sick crew, then, for example, by evacuating them, and the rest of the people remaining on board are not at risk or immediately, then it may be that, that that ship is actually not in distress. And so the remaining passengers and crew can be excluded from port. And indeed, that's what's happened, what Australia was trying to do in the case of its cruise ships. But the law of distress isn't the only applicable law, and Alberto mentioned earlier the international health regulations um, that were agreed um, under the WHO in 2005. And those uh, apply to ships, and there are a number of rules that apply to how to deal with health outbreaks on board ships. In general, states are not supposed to prevent the, the docking and disembarkation of cruise ships as long as it's a, the port is able to deal with the problem. Um, how, however, there's also an overriding right um, to implement health measures in response to a, a public health emergency of an international concern, which this COVID uh, situation is, um, which may include prohibiting uh, the ships from coming on board, um, but they have to be reasonable, necessary, and notified to the WHO. 
So those are conditions on um, what a state can do. Additionally, um, the Maritime Labour Convention, which New Zealand is a party to, gives basic rights to crew members of ships um, to uh, have their immediate health concerns addressed by states when the ship is in its port or its territorial sea. So as you can see, in this situation, the port state has to face a difficult balancing act between providing assistance to the ship and protecting the health of its own citizens. In the case of a ship carrying people infected with COVID-19, the assessment generally comes down to how the safety of people on board can be assured with least risk to the home population. In that case, it might be possible to evacuate sick passengers and crew while prohibiting entry of the cruise ship into port. However, that's the legal situation, and obviously there are clear political and diplomatic reasons why a port state might end up facilitating the ship docking, even if it is not legally required to do so. Uh, one of the problems that arose in the recent situation was that most, if not all, cruise ships are generally flagged to small countries, which are flags of convenience, like Panama and Liberia. Um, if all the cruise ships were denied entry into port, they would have to return to their home ports. And those small countries just simply wouldn't have the ability to deal with the situation if that happened. And so this is why there have been an ongoing, quite touchy political negotiations about how to deal with the cruise ships that were at sea when the pandemic um, arose. Now, I just point out that it's not just cruise ships that this issue of entry into port applies to. And we're starting to see situations where merchant ships um, may be being prohibited from entering ports if previous stops on their journey had been to ports that were affected by COVID-19. And this has led the International Labour Organization to express concern and to call on governments to ensure that, that these, uh, the interests of seafarers are, um, are protected. So thank you very much for your attention and I, hopefully that's been of interest. Thanks, Joanna. We've got a couple of minutes um, for questions, five or six minutes. Um, and what I was going to do is just begin that discussion. Some of the questions I think people who are listening to this have had is really how this all interacts with other stuff that's going on in the international sphere. That Bjorn Oliver, we've got climate change crisis. There are other crises happening in the world. One of those, the various peacekeeping operations, various other things that the UN is trying to do which are all gonna be interfered with by the response to COVID, I suspect. And I just wonder whether it's probably like a thesis topic, I suspect, but um, do any of you have any thoughts about how this interacts with other broader international law issues? Will we all just stop and pause? Will, war, will peace come to war because of COVID? I think that's Alberto. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah good, good point, Jeff. I think that the problem, I, I will just say three things very quickly. One, the problem of funding, uh, exacerbated by the decision of the US to cut its funding to the WHO, is with that we forget that some of these organizations, even though they might need some reform, yet do help the most vulnerable states. In one of the chat's questions, someone mentioned the locust plague in Africa. This is a good example that there are many problems out there and that states who decide to, to stop funding these organizations are in fact creating more areas for tensions and conflict. The, the second thing I will briefly say is that it is important that we're able to cope with COVID-19 well because, and, and uh, you know, Oliver mentioned, there will be other pandemics, other crises, and that we need to be able to find a way of working better together because, and that is the last point I'll make, is simply that, in fact, we have a fragile multilateral system as it is, and instability can only breed more discontent and crisis. And I suppose the other thing which is just occurring now is that it appears that some states are beginning to accuse other states of having done things badly. And certainly it's becoming rhetorical in some places to, to blame China 
and I've just seen note that there's a, some sort of lawsuit in the Eastern District of Missouri against the Republic of China. I'm not entirely sure how that squeaks under the sovereign immunity rule of the United States, but is this like, do we need some sort of, rec is, is there a gap here in terms of resolving these kind of legal issues between states? And how does that fit with the cooperative model of the WHO and its national health prote protection? Yeah, just briefly, I mean, uh, you mentioned there is a question of the sovereign immunity defense applies before the domestic courts of the United States. China can, even if brought by the state of Missouri, Missouri before the courts, will be able to invoke. And if the courts uh, do their job properly, the case will have to be dropped. The, under the WHO constitution, Article 75 does mention that if there is a dispute, that states should try to negotiate or ask for the director general of the WHO to intervene. And if there is no solution, the, the, one of the parties could go theoretically to the ICJ. That said, article, the only article I can think of uh, that could be used is Article 21, that under which the WHO Assembly of the Party adopted the IHRs. The fact is that it, it would be very indirect the only solution in these kind of crises is through negotiation, discussion, cooperation. That's at least my view on that. And I just wonder for Joanna, just because these cruise ships have intrigued many of us. Some of us both like the fact they bring heaps of business to Wellington and they also bring, as it turns out, heaps of pollution to Wellington generally, but now they seem to have bought the virus. Is there some sense that we might need to do a bit more internationally in regulating these things? Should we allow them to be under these flags of convenience or should we require them actually to be backed by real countries? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And flags of convenience, of course, have been um, a real problem for the law of the sea for, for, for decades now. And essentially, um, they arose for economic reasons. Um, companies find it much cheaper to flag to Panama or Liberia or the Marshall Islands because they have fewer regulations and um, perhaps they impose fewer obligations on them. Um, I think um, th this recent situation has highlighted the problem with flags of convenience, but that we've had problems with flags of convenience for a long time. And I think it, it sort of shows that international law is not a perfect system of law. Um, we don't, not, it's not like domestic law where we have a parliament that can impose laws and courts that can interpret them. Essentially, it's the best that we can all agree together. Um, and so sometimes international law can be a bit slow to respond to new challenges. Um, but if political will is there, um, then it, it is entirely possible that, for example, countries like the US could require companies based in the US to flag with the US. Um, so it is actually something that could be addressed um, domestically um, in addition to thinking about international responses. Right, and just before we finish up, I think Susie's got a bit of an addendum to Alberto's comment, but also if I'd ask Susie just to talk a little bit about the place for developing countries in all of this international intellectual property world, because New Zealand is going to be badly placed, as she's explained, but I think there are probably lots of other countries that are even worse placed than us. So, if you want to comment on Alberto's comments yeah. about the WHO and then maybe about yeah. developing countries. Well, my comment was re really ties those two together. So great foresight there, Jeff. So for a while, both the WHO and the UN, partly the development side, but the whole of UN, have had their own investigations into the effects of patents on availability of medicines, distribution of medicines, and so on. And I. I truncate that in the interests of time. Both of them have had clear pushbacks and enormous pushbacks, not only from governments with large pharmaceutical producers, such as the United States, they have had a lot of support from other countries with large pharmaceutical production, I have to say, although the EU as a whole has, is not necessarily as supportive of that work as some of the countries in it. And, uh, that has really been a call to make sure that medicines are better distributed and better available. And that's medicines that actually exist. We're in a situation here where the medicines are not fully proven, the vaccine is not developed, and we do not have the channels of supply, even that Michelle mentioned in another version of opening those up. Rather, what we know is those channels of supply are 
complicated. New Zealand works very hard to keep those open for New Zealand, but it's expensive. So New Zealand, even if we get the vaccine, there's going to be questions around how we make that available to our Pacific neighbours, whether there'll be enough. There's also, of course, huge questions in parts of the developing world about what the level of the pandemic is there and so on and so forth. So organisations outside of the WTO, because the WTO has a role here, have put a huge effort in addressing the channels of supply and so far they have had such a pushback. And that's one of the difficulties that we're seeing. So as I said, and in the interest of, of stopping for time, the, the patent system and the private ownership of pharmaceuticals is really in the test here. And unless they respond positively to the public health response, I think we're going to see a huge reaction to the whole system. Okay, well, thanks. I think we've reached the end of, it, the, end of the hour. I just really want to thank the participants. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody watching has learned a lot, not just about COVID-19, but about different things, you, different ways you can approach international law or think about national legal obligations. As always in international law seminars, I'm left, left somewhere between hope and despair. Maybe, hopefully, just a little bit on the hope side, as always. Um, but I'd like to thank the participants and thank the people that have watched us too um, for taking part in this continuing series of faculty events related to COVID-19 and, and its legal implications. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>